And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Where is the true location of the Garden of Eden? Now, the Garden of Eden and where it possibly could be located is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Now, a couple weeks ago, I did a video called The Dark Continent Theory. The Dark Continent Theory comes from an anime known as Hunter x Hunter. So, the Dark Continent is a place that stretches beyond the known world, which is nested inside the gigantic Lake Mombius. The ancestors of the human race apparently migrated from there to the known world, as the deciphering of myths and the study of ancient ruins seems to testify. So in Hunter x Hunter, there's something known as the Dark Continent, and this is apparently where the origins of the human race comes from. And I believe the Dark Continent theory is actually the Garden of Eden. A couple months ago, I bought a book known as Paradise Found, The Cradle of the Human Race at the North Pole by William F. Warren. Now, the author of this book is suggesting that the Garden of Eden is actually at the North Pole. And William F. Warren isn't some conspiracy theory. In fact, he's the first president of Boston University. So Paradise Found, this book was written in the late 1800s, and I'm just going to read the back of the book to you. The suggestion that primitive Eden was at the Arctic Pole seems at first sight the most incredible of all wild and willful paradoxes. The author was the president of Boston University and states in the preface that the book is not a work of a dreamer. It is a thoroughly serious, sincere attempt to present what is to the author's mind the true and final solution of one of the greatest and most fascinating of all problems connected to the history of mankind. In a word, Mr. Warren believes that the Garden of Eden was at the North Pole. Chapters on the results of explorers such as Prince Eric and David Livingstone, the result of theologians such as Luther and Calvin, and non-theological scholars Massey and the discovery of Atlantis, the author's hypothesis, tested and retested, astronomical, geography, physiographical, geology, and prehistoric climatology. So in this book, he presented evidence that the Garden of Eden is actually at the North Pole. And I believe Mr. Warren might be onto something, because as I'm reading the book, the evidence he presents is pretty convincing and very interesting. And before I start, for those of you who are new to the Garden of Eden and what the Garden of Eden is, it comes from the Bible. In Abrahamic religions, the Garden of Eden, or Garden of God, also called the terrestrial paradise, is the biblical paradise described in, in Genesis 2 through 3 and Ezekiel 28 and 31. The location of Eden is described in the book of Genesis as the source of the four tributaries. In the scriptures, it talks about that the Garden of Eden is this perfect paradise with lots of wonderful, beautiful vegetation and that this place is absolutely magical. In fact, Adam and Eve were supposed to live in this garden forever. They weren't supposed to die until obviously they disobeyed God, they ate the fruit, and then they were kicked out. Now, the scripture says that after Adam and Eve were kicked out, God placed a cherubim angel to guard the garden so that no human may enter into the garden. Now, obviously, the Garden of Eden being in the North Pole sounds a little crazy, right? Today, we're taught that the North Pole has nothing but ice, that there is no lands in the North Pole. There are no hidden lands. However, lots of ancient cartographers depict land in the North Pole in their maps, such as the Mercator map. So this right here is known as the Mercator map, and it was made in the 1600s, so the 15th century. And as you can see, there is land in the middle, and there are four rivers watering the very center of this land. Now, let me read to you a verse from Genesis concerning the Garden of Eden. It says, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Parshion. This is which composite the whole land of Havalia, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedelium and the Onyx Stone. And the name of the second river is Gion. The same is that composite the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hedekel. That is it which goeth towards the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. So it names four rivers that encircle that garden and water it. However, a lot of people like to argue and state well, the Bible already names the lands and places, such as Ethiopia and how the river Gion compasseth the land of Ethiopia. But I have a question. Are all the modern biblical lands we see today, is it the same land that existed pre-flood time? Because obviously the Garden of Eden was made before the flood. The rivers that we had today did not exist before flood times, including the lands as well. Everything was displaced after the flood. But yeah, when it describes Eden, it names these places like Ethiopia and all these rivers like Gion. The Bible states that the river Gion composite the lands of Ethiopia. Now the word composite means to encircle. If you go to modern day Ethiopia, there is no river or traces of a river that encircled the whole land of Ethiopia. 
anywhere near or around. There is no river that encircles the entire land. So what if the lands that are named today are not the exact lands that are mentioned in the Bible concerning the Garden of Eden? Like I said, the earth was a different place before the flood, but that's just a suggestion. So yeah, there's no traces of rivers compassing the lands of Ethiopia. However, in the Mercator map, you clearly see four rivers that are parted, just like Genesis said. Genesis says that the river was parted into four heads, and as you look at the Mercator map, what do you see? You see a river parted, watering the very middle. Now, what's very interesting, the Bible's not the only place where it talks about a legendary island of pure paradise. Throughout the world, there are mentions of an island or a land that is of pure perfection. For example, there is Avalon that comes from Arturian legends, you know, like King Arthur, Merlin, uh, Sir Lancelot, those kind of guys. So Avalon is a legendary island featured in the Arturian legend. It first appears in Geoffrey of Monmouth's 1136 Historia Regum Britannia as the place where King Arthur's sword Excalibur was forged and later where King Arthur was taken to recover from being gravely wounded at the Battle of Camelan. So according to Arturian legend, Avalon is where King Arthur got his magical sword, K.A. Excalibur, and also where he was taken to get healed by Avalon's paradise healing properties. And what I found very interesting about King Arthur is the whole King Arthur's court thing, where you know, the, the Knights of the Round Table. Often depictions of the Round Table, you see knights sitting around a circle, and they're all pointing with their swords to the very center, such as this picture right here, which shows a cross. And I believe that the center represents Avalon, aka the Garden of Eden. And the four sections of the crosses could represent possibly the four rivers that encircle Eden and water the very center. And then in Buddhist mythology, it also talks about a paradise land known as Shambhala, mysteries of the kingdom of Shambhala. Shambhala, which is Sanskrit word meaning place of peace or place of silence, is a mythical paradise spoken of in ancient texts, including the Kalachakra Tantra and the ancient scriptures of the Zongzung culture, which predated Tibetan Buddhism in Western Tibet. According to legend, it is a land where only the pure of heart can live, a place where love and wisdom reigns, where people are immune to suffering, want or old age, so people live forever. Just like in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were supposed to live forever until they were kicked out. Shambhala is said to be the land of a thousand names. It has been called the forbidden land, the land of white waters, land of radiant spirits, land of living fire, land of the living gods, land of wonders. The Hindus called it Aryavarta, the land of the worthy ones. The Chinese know it as Si Tian, the western paradise of Shi Huangmu, and to the Russian old believers, it is known as Bielyavode, which means white waters. But throughout Asia, it is best known by its Sanskrit name Shambhala, Shambhala, or Shangri-La. So again, another legend mentioning a paradise island where you can live forever, a pure bliss and perfection, just like the Garden of Eden, just like Avalon. In Greek mythology, the Hyperboreans were a mythical people who lived in the far northern part of the known world. Their name appears to derive from the Greek Hyperborea, aka Beyond Boreas, aka Beyond the Aurora Borealis. And then of course you have things like in Norse mythology, right? Asgard. In Norse mythology, Asgard is a location associated with gods. It appears in multitude of Old Norse sagas and mythological texts. All these nations, all these cultures and their mythologies talking about a mystical paradise island where you can live forever, where you can heal from wounds. Where it's a land where only the pure can live, only the sinless can live. Again, all these legends sound very similar to the biblical Garden of Eden that was set there by God. Is it possible Shambhala, Avalon, Asgard, Eden, Hyperborea, Atlantis, that all of these names are talking about the same thing, the same magical paradise island? And another thing I found fascinating about the Garden of Eden are the northern lights, these beautiful lights that encircle the North Pole. And then all of our compasses point towards the North Pole. So in the North Pole, in this area, there's something special about this place. In fact, in the book I was reading, The Cradle of the Human Race at the North Pole, it states that many cultures believed that the North Pole was the navel of the Earth, and there's something very special about the North Pole. There's this energy, there's this force there. Another thing I found really interesting, I tried to find clues in the Bible that would imply that there's something special about the North Pole, and I found two very interesting verses. Psalms 48.2 Beautiful for situation, joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And then you have Isaiah 14, 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit upon the mount of congregation in the sides of the north. Now this is the devil talking about being on the same throne as God and exalting himself. And then he says at the very end, in the sides of the north. So Psalms is talking about that the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. Is it possible this is talking about Eden, but not directly saying Eden, 
Look, I don't know for sure, but I know one thing. In the scriptures, it says that God conceals his mystery, that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Let me know your thoughts and ideas. Does the Garden of Eden still exist? Did God preserve his garden like he said in the Bible? I mean, nowhere in the Bible does it mention that he destroyed his garden even during the flood. All he said was that he kicked Adam and Eve out and placed an angel there to guard it. By the way, guys, if you enjoy this channel, I do have a Patreon where I post early access to all my videos. So ad free early access. And the cool thing about Patreon, you get to pick your price. So if you want to pay $5 a month, you can pay $5. If you want to pay a dollar a month, you can pay a dollar and get the same access to Evans. Shout out to Michael and Jordan. Thank you so much for joining my patron, being the first supporters. And to give you guys an incentive to join my patron, every first of the month, I'm going to be doing a $25 to $50 gift card giveaway. So if you guys are interested in that, so if you guys want to just pay a dollar a month, get ad-free early access to videos such as this one, which will be on my Patreon first. Just a dollar a month and you can get all that. Again, guys, thank you so much for your support. Let me know all your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. And we are out.